Hi, Defcon. Um, I'm Alvaro Pontester. Uh, this is Alex. As uh, we said, uh, we both work for um, the HP Fortify team, uh, but we have a lot of things to cover today. So enough about us. Um, so last year was the year of Java deserialization apocalypse, as we like to call it. Like literally uh, dozens or even hundreds of new CVs were reported around Java deserialization. And around those CVs, like thousands of vulnerable applications and appliances, uh, it was like a bad problem. So this was a very well known vector since at least 2011. Um, probably it was not, um, so the community was not paying uh, really like, attention because there was no uh, really good gadget, a really uh, good remote code execution gadget until 2015 when the Apache Commons collection gadget was published. So this was the same problem with um, .NET. The theoretical attack was published in 2012 for both binary formatter and the net data contract serializer, but there was no uh, remote code execution gadget published until now. So at that time, the solution was like, okay, I stop using Java deserialization altogether, and developers were like, well, yeah, I would like to do so, but I need to serialize my, my objects, uh, store them into a database, or maybe, I don't know, uh, send them across a wire or send them in a socket or whatever. So I need to serialize my objects. And the, um, the security guys were like, okay, then use a secure JSON or XML parser or library instead. So our goal with this um, talk is to fold. First of all, we want to verify if those JSON libraries are any better than Java deserialization or .NET uh, deserialization and then raise some awareness around .NET deserialization stuff. As we said with uh, Java, it took like four, uh, four or five years for the community to start looking into um, you know, vulnerable endpoints and so on, and we don't want to, the history to repeat itself, so we will be presenting new remote code execution gadget to attack these um, serializers. So the first section will focus on, on JSON. We will present some of the um, libraries that we found to be vulnerable, gadgets to attack them, and then a demo on a web application framework leading to arbitrary code execution. And then we will focus on the .NET serializers, a completely uh, different subject. And then we will try to generalize the attack and we will provide in some demos as well. So let's jump into the JSON part. So just uh, to set the expectations here, we are not talking about JSON uh, when uh, sending simple data or simple JavaScript objects between a Java, um, a JavaScript front end and a controller like, I don't know, for example, a Spring controller. We are talking about replacing Java or .NET serialization with uh, JSON, which means that you need to serialize Java or .NET objects, which means that you need to support some of the object-oriented programming features like how I'm going to deal with the Java lang object, how I'm going to deal with a system object in .NET, how I'm going to deal with generic, parameterized types, uh, polymorphism, interfaces, and so on. So we will be abusing the, f um, the features that these libraries include to support this OOP stuff. A uh, very quick recap on how Java deserialization or how the attackers were able to get arbitrary code execution on Java deserialization. Uh, basically, they were able to provide untrusted data to the deserializer, in this case, the object input stream in, in Java. And this untrusted data contained some type, some class names that were instantiated by the deserializer. And then some uh, deserialization callbacks, like read object or read, uh, read resolve, were invoked. And then the attackers were able to start a gadget chain that is nothing else than connecting different classes um, together, assembling like a gadget chain leading to arbitrary code execution, but starting from this read object or read resolve uh, deserialization callbacks. However, JSON does not invoke any of these deserialization callbacks normally, or at least some of the, most of the libraries. So we need to find some, um, some other ways to start a gadget chain leading to this code execution. So um, most of the um, JSON libraries will work in, well, uh, will try to reconstruct the object in any of these ways. So basically they will invoke the default constructor in order to um, instantiate the, the object and allocate the memory and then use either reflection or setters in order to populate the fields and properties of, of, the, um, of the instance. Some of them will invoke some special constructors or deserialization callbacks or type converters. We don't have time in this talk to cover all of them, uh, but these are also vectors that lead to arbitrary code execution. We have, uh, we have them covered in our white paper that has, will be published in the uh, DEF media server. 
And then most of these libraries also invoke some um, common methods, like for example, hash code or equals normally get invoked uh, when deserializing uh, hash tables. To a string normally get invoked when um, raising exceptions. Finally, it's always invoked by the garbage collector wi when claiming the, the memory for the objects. But uh, by far, the most common one is uh, the setters. Setters are normally invoked by most, if not all, of the libraries. So if we are able to find arbitrary um, code execution gadget chains starting with setters, we will be able to use them to attack these libraries. Let's have a look on a few setter gadgets in .NET. All of them can lead to arbitrary code execution. Some of them has own requirements and limitations, but we believe that it's not very difficult to pick up proper one for specific case. So our first gadget is a setter of path property in assembly installer class. It allows code execution during uh, library loading uh, from path controlled by an, uh, by an attacker. Uh, it, there is no additional requirements if uh, assembly with payload is on local machine, but in case of remote resources, uh, .NET framework may have some additional security checks. The next two gadgets use, use uh, a XAML parser. Uh, we will show a bit later how it can be used for arbitrary method invocation. So, a uh, setter of property inspector font and color data in workflow designer type requires single threaded apartment thread. It's quite a strong requir uh, requirement, but if your target ha has such configuration, you will get remote code execution. The next gadget is source setter of resource dictionary type. Uh, it has a few requirements to mm, JSON and Marshaller. It should call setters for types uh, that implement I dictionary interface. Uh, often in such cases, uh, unmarshallers are just populating key value pairs. Um, also, it should be able to reconstruct system URI object. This type doesn't have a default constructor. But often, um, uh, unmarshallers can do this. And our final gadget is uh, object data provider type. It's quite flexible and allows um, a lot of ways to for attack. As a result, we were able to use it in almost all our unmarshallers and formatters. So let's have a look on a uh, call diagram of this gadget. Setter will call refresh method. It will invoke begin query. It will call query worker. And finally, in invoke method on instance, we can see the line that will uh, call our arbitrary method. Uh, here we can see example of JSON payload that will uh, pop up calculator for unsafe configuration of JSON.NET parser. Actually, this uh, gadget uh, allows the next main attack vectors. We can call non default constructor with own arguments or can invoke a public method on unmarshaled object or we can call any public method, including static ones, with our own parameters. Uh, Java has own uh, setter gadget as well. After our, our last year research in uh, GNDI injection attack, we have found a few setters with GNDI uh, lookup calls. By the way, Oracle recently disabled uh, RMI and Corba vectors in default configuration of Java, but LDAP vector still works. So our gadget set session factory GNDI name in statistic service. We already mentioned about this in our last year talk at Black Hat 2016. Very similar to it, it's two string gadget from remote client user transaction class. And finally, set auto commit gadget from already known uh, class, GDBC row set impl. Let's have a look on it. it this uh, class is from GRE libraries, so doesn't, doesn't require any external dependencies. Setter will call connect function. And here we can see uh, uh, that we will call in the initial context lookup method with our value from uh, data source name property. So we will get remote code execution. Apart from shared gadget that allows code execution by themselves, we have a couple other interesting gadgets. Some of them can be used as building uh, blocks for gadget chain like mm, binding source set data member in .NET or string template to string in Java can be used for arbitrary got, uh, getter calls. Other can trigger non-RCE attacks, uh, for example, inner XML in XML data document or um, setter of data view setting collection string in data view manager 
can be used for a uh, XML external entities attack in some version of .NET framework. Now we will back to Alvaro. He will show where we can use these old gadgets. So we analyzed like multiple Java and .NET JSON libraries and uh, we found that most of them were vulnerable to arbitrary code execution, some of them in their default configuration and some of them um, developers need to enable or configure them in a special way. So we came up with this uh, simple high level requirements for a library to be vulnerable to this attack. Basically the attacker needs to be able to control the type or the class that is going to be instantiated in the server. Um, that normally means that in the JSON that you are um, intercepting, for example, there will be an attribute called something like underscore type or dollar type class type object class name that uh, contains a value that looks like a .NET or a Java class name. Then the library will instantiate uh, that uh, type and then the second requirement is that the attacker or well in this case the library needs to invoke some methods on this reconstructed object. And finally the third uh, requirement is that the attacker needs to be able to assembly a remote code execution gadget chain um, starting from those methods that are invoked by the uh, by the library. As I said before setters are normally invoked in most of the libraries so the, the gadgets that uh, Alex just presented are normally uh, can be normally used for any library. So we categorize these libraries um, according to the likelihood of them being vulnerable and for that we uh, choose two different factors. The first one is whether the library includes the type discriminator that is nothing else than the class name in the serialized data like we have seen uh, here for example in json.net. And uh, so that can be done like by default by the, by the library or developers may need to enable um, a configuration setting. And then the second factor is how this library prevent uh, malicious types from being instantiated and, and loaded. So we found that some of these libraries perform a post deserialization cast which uh, uh, offers no security at all because basically by the time that you get uh, the uh, cast exception the payload has already been executed and you're already been compromised. And the second type control is what we call the inspection of the expected type object graph which sounds like a little bit complex but it's nothing else that the library will take the expected type so for example uh, a user the library may be expecting a user or a cart or whatever and then analyzing the object graph and checking if what uh, the user is sending in the um, in the JSON data is assignable to the types defined in the object graph. So some libraries go further and also build a white list at construction time and apply this list at runtime during the deserialization. We found that these um, these libraries, the libraries performing this type control, are also vulnerable if the attacker can control the expected type. That is more common than you may think, and we will see an example uh, an example later. And also, if the attacker can find an injection point, an entry point in the object graph. So, for example, as we can see here in this um, example object graph here, all the properties in red may be uh, good examples of entry points. Like, for example, a system object property, a non-generic collection property like hash table, array list, and so on. So again we don't have time to cover uh, how to find entry points but this is also covered in the in the white paper. So this is the list of the JSON libraries that we analyzed. The ones in red are vulnerable by default so fast JSON, uh, sweet JSON, JSON IO and flex JSON should never be used with untrusted data. Basically they include the type information by default and they perform no um, type control at all. Then they invoke setters so we can use our setters to get uh, arbitrary code execution. The ones in yellow and orange depends on the developers and how they are using the library. So most of them uh, that do, do not include the type information by default in the JSON data but there is this uh, configuration setting that can be enabled uh, to do exactly that. And then they perform this inspection of the object graph so you need to find an entry point. You may think that uh, finding an application that satisfies both requirements is difficult but it's kind of the opposite because if developers has a property of for example of system object they will be forced to uh, enable this configuration setting to include the type information and then make this class uh, or this type serializable. So uh, well uh, JSON um, is the only one in green. We found that it's very difficult to make it vulnerable. You can also uh, implement a type adapter and make it uh, vulnerable but I mean you need to ha to do it like in purpose. And in addition it does not invoke any setter, it just uses reflection. So you need to use or to find gadgets starting for example with the finalize method which is uh, more difficult than, than the setter one. So let's see some of these examples. For example fast JSON is one of the ones in red should never be used with untrusted data. 
And basically, yeah, it includes the type information by default. It does not offer any uh, type, con uh, type protection or type control. And then it will invoke the setter. So we will be able to use, for example, our object data provider gadget to get arbitrary code execution like we did in this Calico CMS that is a, well, a .NET content management system. Then we have a JavaScript serializer that is one of the .NET native libraries in, in the .NET framework. By default, it does not include the type information, but uh, developers can do that by uh, passing this simple type resolver or any other type resolver to the constructor of the JavaScript serializer, and then deserializing and trusted data. So by the way, all these examples um, are from GitHub, so this is real code. Um, basically, this JavaScript serializer does not offer any type control. It performs a post deserialization cast operation, so it, uh, it it's vulnerable by default if developers are uh, configuring it with a type resolver. Then we have the data contract JSON serializer that is probably one of the most secure ones. Um, but, um, well, it performs this assignability check that we talked before, but also this creation of a whitelist at uh, construction time that is then applied at runtime time. So with that, the only way a develop, um, an attacker can get arbitrary code execution on this library is if they can control the expected type. Um, again, this is from GitHub. It's an example of how the type can be controlled by the attacker. In this case, uh, it's coming from a cookie. We will see an example in DNN that is one of the most popular CMS for .NET where they are doing exactly this. And then we have JSON.NET that is uh, probably the most popular library. It's even recommended by Microsoft over their own uh, native libraries. Uh, again, by default, does not include type information, but if developers enable this type name handling setting, then they will include this information. Um, this is another example from GitHub, as you can see, because it contains this class uh, called message, because it contains a body property, which is a system object type, then developers are forced, as I said before, to enable these uh, configuration settings to include the type information. And then the library will invoke setters, serializable constructor, callbacks, and even some on error custom callbacks. So um, basically, the attacker has like a very large uh, gadget space to, to get arbitrary code execution. So let's see an example, a demo. Uh, this is Breeze, that is a web application framework, uh, which basically, well, it's not really a web application framework, it's more a data management framework. So it offers a REST API for both uh, JavaScript and .NET clients to connect to the API and perform like entity management operations like uh, adding a new record, uh, deleting a record, updating a record, and so on. So we found that this framework was using JSON.NET, which is, like, as I said, the, the most popular JSON library for .NET, and is configured to include the type information when serializing the um, system object properties. So at some point, uh, this code here will deserialize untrusted data coming from the request. And then, as you can see here, basically, uh, this safe options um, type here is the expected type. So I said that we have to do this expected type object graph inspection, which is quite simple in this case because the safe option type only contains two properties. The second one is uh, name tag, and it's a system object property. So we can, this is our injection point, our entry point to place the, the payload. So with that, let's see an example. This is Carbons. That is one of the sample applications that come from with the, with the framework uh, for developers to, to learn the framework. And basically, um, in this example, we can just add new um, car models or rename the models and so on. So if we change the name of this model and we um, intercept the request with verb, we will see that, um, well, we have all the expected data, like for example, the new model name is appearing in the, in the JSON data that is being submitted to the REST API. And then we have this empty safe options dictionary. If we send this request to the server, we will see that there is, in the response, there is this dollar $type attribute, which is our indicator that this is using JSON.NET and that is including type information. So that's, those are the ingredients uh, for our arbitrary code execution. We will be using our object data provider gadget um, basically to invoke the process.start and pop up a calculator when the uh, framework process this uh, request. So we will just replace this empty dictionary with the payload. And then let's check that in the victim server, there is no calculators running. And now as soon as we submit the request, this will get deserialized and we will get arbitrary code execution. So 
thank you. Uh, so this is a popular, uh, rather popular uh, framework in .NET, and a big uh, shout out to the developers because they fixed the issue in just one day. Um, also, a big shout out to Moritz Betzler, that is a Java security researcher. On um, May 22, he published this Java Marsaler security paper, which basically is similar to our research, um, shares the same premises and conclusions. Uh, well, uh, he overlaps with our research in the Jackson and JSON IO libraries, although for the JSON one, he found like a completely different vector. And he over also overlaps uh, with us in our JDBC Roset Impulse class uh, or gadget. Uh, but this was like a kind of um, like obvious choice because it was previously used in the Java digitalization world. Uh, also, he found other interesting gadgets for Java in third party libraries like Spring. So if you are interested in a more Java focused version of this talk, go and check his, his work. So now we will change um, gears and focus in .NET serializers. Let's back to the .NET world. S potential security problems with binary formatter and net data uh, contract serializer were known for the year. For example, the great work of James Forshaw uh, about uh, weaknesses and main uh, attacks in uh, in this um, main uh, .NET uh, formatters was presented at Black Hat 2012. So five years ago. Um, unfortunately, we could not find a good um, available remote code execution guided chain. There was one published by Florian Gaultier, but it uses memory corruption, so it's not very easy to build universal exploit for different versions of Windows. But we were sure that there should be a lot of ways uh, to get code execution during .NET deserialization. So we spent some of our time and have found one that can be in used in binary formatter and some other .NET formatters. But after our work was ready and accepted by Black Hat, the same James Forshu published a couple remote code execution gadget as part of his own research, by the way, not connected with our topic. Anyway, you can find details about this gadget on uh, his post on uh, uh, Google Project Zero block. Here we will focus on our own. We will use PS object type. It is part of PowerShell libraries, so should be available in almost all Windows machine. Before we go further, there are a couple remarks about this gadget. Uh, in PowerShell uh, version one, uh, this type is not serializable, so it's not suitable for attack. But all modern version of Windows, starting from Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012, are shipped with newer and vulnerable version. Uh, the next uh, remark, we reported this issue to Microsoft and two weeks ago uh, they uh, released a fix. So if you, are not, if you are not ignoring their updates, you should be safe. So PS object. Uh, for deserialization, it uses custom deserializer. And in case of TIM instance, it will call TI, uh, rehydrate TIM instance property method. Here we can see that attacker is able to specify own type as element type of array and uh, the serializer will try uh, to reconstruct uh, object of this type. To find proper way to do this, it will use figure conversion method. It's quite interesting method for an attacker as there are a lot of options for the attack. Uh, we highlighted only the most obvious one. So we can call non-default constructor with one argument and we can control its value. Um, also, we can invoke setters on, on public properties, so we can use our gadgets, earlier gadgets. And also, we can use static parse method uh, of arbitrary type. Let's try to use this one. Sorry. As we said earlier, some reader parse can, use, can be used for uh, arbitrary method invocation. Here we can see examples of payload that will call process start with our argument. Here we can notice uh, namespace, assembly, type, method name, and finally calc as an argument. Along with mentioned uh, binary and net data contract serializer uh, formatters, .NET offers a lot of others. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time for a detailed review of each of them, so we will briefly cover uh, them in our today uh, talk, and if you're interested in deeper analysis, we can offer outweight paper as good source. So we can group them in two big groups. 
formatters, there are vulnerable in default configuration like binary formatter, sub formatter, net data contract serializer. Also, we can add here uh, formatters that internally use them like object state formatter, loss formatter, binary message formatter. They should not be used with uh, untrusted data or you have to proper configure them to limit available types. For example, use a uh, restricted type resolver with white listed types. Other group uh, formatters that are safe in default configuration like XML serializer, data contract serializer, data contract JSON serializer. But if you are using quick data contract resolver, by the way, we have met such examples even on official uh, Microsoft documentation, or attacker is able to control, control expected type, you will have very serious security problem. We will show a bit later that in this case, uh, code execution is real even for, for the most limited uh, formatters. For example, XML serializer. Now we'll switch back to Alvaro. He will show our next demo. So, because our demo is probably worth a thousand slides, uh, we will show you how to get arbitrary code execution on some .NET frameworks. In this case, Nancy, that is a web application framework um, that is very similar to the Ruby's um, Sinatra framework, but for .NET. And well, basically, they care about security, which is good, and they implemented CSRF protection. The only thing is that by protecting against CSRF, they open the doors for remote code execution. But yeah. So uh, instead of putting this uh, unique token into the cookie like most of the frameworks do, um, they created like a, a type called CSRF instance where they put this token and then they serialize this uh, instance of CSRF token and then they base 64 encode the payload, in t well, the, payload the, the cookie into the cookie. Anyway, if you find this AAE AAD magic number in any of your pen tests, then uh, you, will get, uh, you will be able to get arbitrary code execution. So let's see that in action in one application. So this is an application we built using Nancy. And we were able to get arbitrary code execution, uh, pre-authentication, by basically replacing the cookie. So uh, this is the cookie that the framework injects, the NCSR cookie. As you can see, it contains this magic number and then this uh, base64 encoded blob. Uh, if we check the page, they also include the same value as a hidden um, field in, in the form. So they are doing like a double submission, which is good. But uh, since they are using binary format serialization, then uh, it's not that good. Anyway, uh, we serialize our PS object gadget uh, in order to pop up a calculator with the calculator payload. And then we are just basically replacing the cookie with our payload. You can use our payload or any of uh, James Forso published payload. Uh, and now if we go back to the server, there are no calculators running. And as soon as we submit the form, we, should, well, we'll, we will get an exception, but we will get our payload executed. So. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we just wanted to highlight that this is not really a problem in JSON or XML parsers or, uh, I don't know, Java digitalization or the binary formatter for .NET. This is a problem in serializers themselves because all of them need uh, to reconstruct the objects during the digitalization process and that means instantiating types that normally can be controlled by attackers and then invoking methods. So as we said before, these simple three high level requirements like the attacker being able to control the type, then the, um, some methods being called on this reconstructed type and then a large enough gadget space for the attacker to find um, arbitrary code execution gadget chain will normally apply to any serializer on any language. Uh, as we said before, uh, most of the times the setters will be invoked. So the gadgets that we presented here today, the object data provider gadget and the JDBC raw settle impulse gadget will normally, will normally be um, good gadgets to attack any other libraries. So um, we found like many other libraries being vulnerable or being uh, as susceptible to arbitrary code execution, um, but we don't have space in the slide or time to cover all of them. So these are good examples of them. For example, FSPickler or SARP serializer are .NET serializers that work not just in the .NET uh, framework, but also in .NET Core, uh, Silverlight, or uh, Windows Mobile Phone, for example. So developers may choose them instead of the native one because they are uh, suitable for their needs. 
And well, all of them include type information by default. They invoke setters and they perform either no type control at all or just the object graph inject inspection. So attacker may need to find these entry points. Also, we have Wire that is now known as Hyperion. That is the serializer for ACA.NET. If you are familiar with the Scala or Java version of the library, it's a um, framework for concurrency based on, on actors. So you have like different actors exchanging messages. And these messages were uh, serialized with uh, JSON.NET using this type name handling setting equals to all, so it was vulnerable. But then they replaced this JSON.NET serializer with Hyperion, that is their, their custom serializer. And uh, well, this Hyperion uh, includes uh, type discriminators, invoke setters, and then uh, perform node type control. So again, it's another vulnerable library. Also, uh, be aware of rolling your own format. For example, this Nancy framework that we talked about before, uh, they moved away from binary formatter because, um, well, it was not included in the first version of .NET Core, and they want uh, the framework to be compatible with .NET Core. So they moved away from binary formatter, and then they created their own JSON library. And as you can see here, it includes a type discriminator that is called type object in this case, and then it will invoke the setter. So we were also able to get arbitrary code execution on the pre-release 2.x branch of this framework. Uh, we also found a very interesting CMS that is one of the most popular CMS for, for .NET, if, if not the most, that is called .NET Nuke. And they use a XML serializer to serialize um, arbitrary types. Since XML serializer need to know the type ahead of time, then they created this wrapper around XML serializer where uh, they would, in a cookie, in a web cookie, they were yeah, setting the type that was going to be used for the .NET uh, XML serializer and then the payload for the XML serializer. So um, this was like a challenge for us because XML serializer, as Alex said, is the most limited serializer in .NET. It basically doesn't allow you to do many things like serializing a system type property or serializing a, a type, for example, with interface members. So if we were able to get arbitrary code execution on XML serializer, we were like confident that we were going to be able to do that for any other libraries. So uh, we tried with our, our object data provider gadget and so far, so good. It was like XML serializer friendly. No problem so far. Now, if we try to use that gadget to invoke process.start, then we had a problem because the process type contains interface members, so um, XML serializer doesn't like it. That problem was easily solved because you can choose gadgets from anywhere else, like, for example, the SAML reader load method, the object state formatter deserialize method, or you can even look for gadgets in your target um, class, uh, class path or, or type. So, for example, since we are attacking .NET Nuke, we search for gadgets in .NET Nuke, and we found that they have this file system utils type, which is very handy for uh, hackers because they contain methods to deploy web cells and methods to uh, read any arbitrary files into the HTTP response. So, very convenient for us. So, now the next uh, problem was that XML serializers builds a whitelist of allowed types at construction time. And then it applies the whitelist at runtime, runtime time. So that was a problem because um, we need to send an instance, for example, of our SAML reader or the file system URL types as the payload, and these types are not going to be included in the whitelist. So we needed to find some way to full XML serializer to include our arbitrary types into the whitelist. And we did that basically by using a parameterized type as the expected type, as you can see down there and then we use the first parameterized type to place our payload type like files, file system utils and then the second type to put our object data provider type. So with that uh, we were able to get arbitrary code execution pre-authentication on .NET Nuke. Um, at first these uh, guys from .NET Nuke assigned like a low severity um, which was like weird because it's pre-authentication RC and they said that this uh, severity was assigned because um, attacker needs to be able to understand how the cookie works. And we were like, okay, dude, you know your framework is open source, right? So anyway, they changed that to critical at the end. So this is the source code for the relevant part. At some point, um, it reads, for example, when you visit the 404 error page, it uh, executes this code. And as, as you can see here, uh, well, uh, it's reading the cookie with, uh, that is named DNM personalization and then passing this uh, XML cookie into this deserialized hash table XML method. If we check this method, it's basically extracting the type from the XML cookie 
like here, and then using this type name to construct the XML serializer. So the attacker can control the expected type as we said before. Now is uh, deserializing the rest of the cookie. So uh, this is what a uh, DNN personalization cookie looks like in a real DNN um, application. As you can see here, it contains the type and then the inner blue box is basically the payload for the XML serializer. And this is what our payload looks like. So the expected type contains this parameterized type which contains uh, our runtime payload types and then the inner blue box is our payload for the object data provider. So in this case, instead of popping up a calculator, we um, are using the file system utils class in .NET Nuke to basically download our web shell and deploy it into the IIS uh, root folder. So let's see that in action. So this is the out of the box installation of DNN. If you run it, um, visit a non existent page, you will get your 404 error page. Sorry, this page you are looking for is not here. And if we send that to Burp, um, well, the request does not contain the DNN personalization cookie, but by reading the code, we know that it's processing this cookie. So we will just include it manually, like DNN personalization, and then we will basically paste the XML payload that I showed you before, which, as I said, is using the pull file method in the file system utils class that is provided by DNN to uh, deploy the web shell. So let's paste this into the request, format this a little bit, and now in the victim server, we will check that, well, we don't have this shell ASPX web shell that we are downloading. So now, as soon as we execute the request, the shell ASPX will appear, as you can see there. And, well, we'll be able to basically yeah, interact with the system um, basically by visiting the web page and install whatever we want to do. Thank you. So with that, uh, just to wrap up, just um, remember that this is not a problem in JSON or XML or, I don't know, any of the serializers. So try to avoid deserializing untrusted data. We saw this is also a problem in Ruby, Python, PHP. So um, do not deserialize untrusted data. And if you have to, um, get your library evaluated by some security guys. Uh, try to avoid libraries that perform no type control. So they are ju just doing the post deserialization cast. Try to avoid libraries that include type discriminators. It's not like a, it's not a sufficient requirement for arbitrary code execution, but it's a good indicator that you will be able to get arbitrary code execution. And also, don't allow developers to let users control expected type like we saw in DNN. And last but not least, try to not roll your own format because you can yeah, just fuck it up. So with that, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, these are our emails. <laughs>